All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to um, Horace's Global Meeting. Um, this is a this is a very interesting panel. We've had loads of interesting panels this morning, but uh, I'm particularly excited about this one because this is very close to home for me. Um, I, uh, you know, this is very close to my heart because this is something that we as journalists um, and you know, sort of um, allies of journalists, we keep talking about quite a lot. Um, is how do we stop the spread of misinformation or how do we check misinformation? I mean, one of the things that this topic says in its description is very apt, where news about 10 years ago or 20 years ago was very different compared to what news is right now. Um, in previous times, you know, if there was something that happened by the time the reporter would be at the site and then write the story and then go get that story edited and then published and then get, get to the reader, reader. In many cases, 24 hours would go by or, you know, 10 to 12 hours would go by. So there's very little reaction that you would have building up to the actual publishing of that news. That's that's not what happens anymore. Uh, what happens is when something happens, when something breaks, the first thing that happens is you get a Twitter alert or you know people, people log on to social media and start talking about it. So I'm a journalist. Many times I find myself very challenged by that where I'm sitting behind the behind my laptop and I have this Twitter thread on the side where people are already talking about it, analyzing, and they've forgotten about it. By the time the story goes out, they've probably forgotten about it. Um, or there is another controversy that goes on. How do you how do you try and make sure that your reporting is balanced? It takes out any sort of misinformation from there. And how do you go about fact checking? Because sometimes when you hear stories, you have the first thing as a journalist that you do is you go ahead and you try and find out whether that's actually true. So to give you an example, last year when you know, there were loads of guidelines that kept, kept coming from the WHO, the first guideline was masks are okay to wear. And the second time they came around and said, you know, masks don't really mean anything because people can still get COVID. Then they came, they took another U-turn and they said, no, actually, you know what, wear double masks now. So people were confused. We were confused as journalists. But then there was this alternate um, platform where, you know, there was different kind of things coming where there was, they said that you don't really need to wear masks. There are other ways in which you can actually uh, take care of COVID or prevent COVID. And you all constantly felt like you were uh, challenged by that. You were working with that. So I think today we're going to talk a lot about this. Today we're going to talk about how our panelists, they look at the, um, you know, sort of news, the responsibility that news organizations have. But at the same time, how we uh, as reporters and as readers can work together to ensure that we uh, don't, you know, we sort of avoid this spread of misinformation, really. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we'll go to our panelists and we'll give them uh, two to three minutes to uh, you know introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they do and their opening remarks. And then from then on, we'll start talking about uh, various aspects of this particular topic. So we have with us today joining us from Portugal as, is Peter Milan. She's the co-founder of Jade Eli Technologies. Um, we have uh, uh, First Bell, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Fat Fathom. Is that right? Yep. Um, and uh, so Fergus and uh, Peter, welcome to the panel. Uh, great to have you both. I want to start with Peter. Um, the floor is yours, Peter. If you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then sort of we'll take it from there. And your opening remarks. Thank you. I'm Peter Milan. Um, I'm the co-founder of JDLI Technologies and also the founder of Transcendent Media Capital. So I've worked um, for many years in the space of convergence of media and technology. And uh, we design um, businesses uh, through TMC, which is a venture studio that tackle systemic, social and environmental challenges by creating for-profit businesses um, along a system. Uh, in order to transform it. And in addition to that, I'm also a filmmaker um, and I've done a lot of writing and directing myself of commercial short films, a variety of different things. Um, and I'm on some leadership groups like uh, on the International Advisory Board for the World Sustainable Development Forum. I'm an Associate Fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and a number of others. So um, I'm really grateful to be joining the panel today uh, to talk about this uh, topic. It's something that I've been approached to talk about quite a lot over the past, well, basically since Trump was elected, I think. <laughs> and uh, there was a big international flurry around this concept of fake news. So um, I'm happy to talk about it again and hopefully uh, try and bring some interesting perspectives to the to the topic. Let's go over to Fergus. Uh, thanks. So I'm I'm Fergus. Well, I'm the founder and CEO of of Fathom, uh, and we're an independent news lab and agency that works um, 
with the news industry and those working within the news industry to improve things like newsroom and communication processes, make use of emerging, emerging technologies that would um, benefit the industry and um, tackle the ever increasing problems of mis and disinformation. Uh, I'm a trained journalist um, and I've worked for a number of org news organizations from CNN to press where I was um, a journalist and producer and the agency's first international social media editor. So my I started going to marketing conferences where brands were trying to find unhappy customers using social media, talking about it on social media. And, um, and I figured that this was a way that we could find people who are in new situations. And this was happened to be around the time of the Arab Spring. And so on the first day of the protests in uh, Tahrir Square in, in Cairo, I was asked to see if I could try this new thing out of, and find people who were in this situation. And um, I never went back to my to my day job after that because um, we were able to do that. So um, I've been fighting misinformation for a while, starting with that verification of user generated content uh, all the way through the kind of evolution from uh, to, to from verification to open source investigation to fact checking to where we are now, which is just a, a hybrid of all of this. Um, at the moment, Fathom's kind of most high profile work is a, an initiative called Viral Facts, um, which is in collaboration with the World Health Organization in Africa and all of the continent's uh, official fact checking organizations. And it's with this initiative uh, fights vaccine uh, and COVID misinformation using a social first strategy and combining theory around how to tackle misinformation with editorial and journalism best practice um, to create kind of highly engaging shareable content. Um, and just to kind of on the topic of the kind of change of the media and misinformation ecosystem, I think in the 10 years that I've been doing this, it's the pace has been very fast. Um, but if you look back kind of 15, 20 years from when people first started going online to look for news and information and the sheer volume of people and content now, we're in an entirely different place. And I think something that I've noticed is that uh, bad actors are the first people to work out how to manipulate these systems. Um, but they've come up, they find ways that actually work. Um, and and now we see the, the good actors or the non-bad actors, genuine people using those same tactics for genuine purposes um, because it works. Uh, and that adds to the noise. Um, but I do uh, I say this as a journalist that, that the news industry is well-placed to deal with mis and disinformation. Um, but not on its own. Um, fact checkers are doing amazing work, but people who know about fact checkers uh, are probably the ones that don't need to know about fact checkers and fact checkers reach is incredibly small. So I think it's a, a huge issue and, and I'm excited to talk more about it. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I want to go back to what Peter said uh, in her opening remarks about this concept of fake fake news or the term fake news is something that was talked a lot more when Trump really was elected. Um, personally, as a journalist, I heard, I kept sort of, you know, using this particular phrase or hearing a lot more about it when, you know, four years of Trump's election into the office, um, lots and lots of fact checking going on behind the scenes. Suddenly we, f we saw that we were working closely with our fact checking desk, um, which was just one person, I think, previously. But then suddenly we had loads of people who we had hired. Uh, we also put into practice a number of softwares that, you know, we, we could potentially look at if there was any any claims that were made that were unsubstantiated. So um, I know the news organization have really sort of stepped up to do that, but there is still a lot, as you said, Fergus, there's still so much more that can be done. Um, and it's not the responsibility, not doesn't just lie with the news organizations. It, it, it is a lot more than that. Um, how, how can we go about uh, ensuring that these, uh, you know, there is a bit more uh, sort of work that happens between news organizations and its readers? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, if, if I can bring in Peter here um, and, you know, sort of your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I don't really love the term fake news um, because I think it, it in itself is misleading because I don't think that there are huge amounts of journalists out there with the intention to mislead. I think one of the things that's important is to understand bias 
and as communities, we need to understand bias in reporting. Uh, one thing that I've talked about regularly on panels is understanding who finances the different types of news reporting, right? Because now uh, getting things past an editor's desk Often it has to be aligned with whatever the ethos or the philosophy of the organization is. And if it's, um, you know, News Incorporated, it has like one particular ethos. If it's, you know, a different type of news media, then it has another. And, and I think that as communities, and we're seeing this in communities response to putting pressure on corporations and, and, uh, and funds to invest sustainably. We're seeing that there is a professionalization of activists of groups to to lobby and 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 create content around things that they're really passionate about and one thing that happened probably about 20 years ago is there was a transition from what was seen as independent reporting to op-ed pieces so opinion editorials and then opinion editorials started getting presented like news uh, rather than acknowledged as opinion. And I think there's been a blurring of the lines between fact-based reporting and opinion-based reporting. And so as a community, we actually have a responsibility to equip ourselves to A, understand the bias of the things that we're reporting about or are being reported, and also to understand the impact, be able to independently fact-check and understand the impacts of the think, the actions we take as as civic members of a society with a civic responsibility and duty. And one thing, you know, I've I had uh, a very close and, and, and personal experience in, in northern Myanmar where in 2012 I was be able to get behind the front lines um, in the Kachin independence fight for their um, right to exist on their native lands. And I saw a BBC journalist reporting on this topic and referring to the Kachin Independence Army as rebel groups, right? And I had a huge argument about this particular reporter's lack of ethics in reporting on things that he didn't understand or that he hadn't equipped himself to, to become deeply knowledgeable about because you can't position a group as a rebel group when they're an ethnic group that have been living there since pre, you know, Orwellian days uh, with a right to live on their native lands who are undergoing a lot of murder and ethnic cleansing. Um, so this distortion of perception is a challenge when the speed with which to respond to new events, as you were mentioning earlier, really impacts journalists. And it's easy to dip in and start reporting and speaking on things when we don't have subject matter expertise, we haven't researched thoroughly, we don't have the opportunity to research thoroughly because we have to be responsive. So how do we balance out all of these factors and knowing that the pressure for continuous reporting, you know, 24-7 across multiple media channels across the globe, which is totally transformed from 30 years ago. Um, how do we, I think communities have more of a responsibility now to participate in the fact-checking process, in understanding the biases and becoming active contributors uh, not only to the content, but in the responsibility of their own thinking, their own ability to think critically. So I think a large part of this is is how do we educate communities, not just putting the onus onto the news distributors, but how do we educate communities, become active, responsible participants in uh, what's happening globally around news? Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. I think uh, just sort of before we go to Fergus, the one of the big challenges as a journalist, and I can talk about because I'm sort of the, on the other side here, is trying to break down information in a very, very quick moment and then get that news out very quickly because you're competing with your competitors. So sometimes when things happen, uh, you know, you find yourself with no subject matter knowledge and you still have to report on that. Um, I think over the in the last many years now, new organizations have become a bit more um, sort of training oriented. So there's loads of trainings that go on. So, so for instance, when the um, for the last couple of weeks when, uh, you know, there was so much going on in Israel, all of us in, uh, you know, in the company, we were just sort of constantly being trained and trying to be told what the subject matter is, giving, giving us a bit more sort of behind the scenes, so to speak 
because that's that's hopefully helps. But then again, that's not it. That's not that's just one little piece of the pie. There is still just so much out there from the moment the news gets out to the moment the news re reaches the reader. So, uh, Fergus, I mean, where what 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 more do you think we can do, or what more do you think is required to ensure that this gap between re re you know sort of the news organizations and the readers is filled, and the and the responsibility lies with both and not just with one party? Well, I think that transparency is probably the key here. It is perfectly okay to admit what you don't know and be able to report what you do know um, without sowing doubt um, if you report it responsibly. And I think if we just go back to to the first point, which is about fake news, we have to remember that one man invented the phrase fake news to use it about things that he didn't agree with. And mm -hmm. it got picked up because it was a sexy phrase and it worked uh, as a way of blaming things on people. And, and we got too sucked into it. And I attend many uh, conference after conference after conference, and we spend a lot of time trying to define fake news or uh, when really, Defining fake news doesn't matter because people can use it however they want, and that's ne never going to change. What we need to think about is action, uh, action in terms of doing that. So on the issue of transparency, by the media used to occupy this position where we talked to an audience. Now I think we're in a position where we talk with an audience. And um, by being transparent about what we do and, and do not know, we can um, we can gain their trust, which has been lost whoever you want to blame that loss of trust on is 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 kind of irrelevant but it's been lost um another way that we can use transparency apart from kind of admitting to our errors is to talk about our process so i've been in newsrooms where the editor says no one cares you know how the news is made that may have been true but that's not true anymore and so some of the work that i've been involved in in fighting misinformation in places like India around their elections is we were, uh, we created a WhatsApp tip line. So we were able to have people send things that they were seeing uh, into us and we would debunk. And we gave them a response, but we didn't just say, this is true, this is false, this is misleading. We said, this is true because, and we gave them a breakdown of the sources that we checked um, and the reasons why we had got to that conclusion and that and so we were giving them what they wanted but at the same time we were giving them a little bit more and I kind of described this as media literacy or misinfo literacy via a Trojan horse we package up the lesson in the in the content of the story or the information itself and that transparency means that people can go and check it for themselves we get to earn their trust because they can check what we have done against the sources that we have checked ourselves and shared with them. And so I think transparency is the way that we we move forward and not endlessly trying to work out where we were two years ago and why, because it's moved so quickly. Yeah, it's very interesting that you talk about India because um, that's definitely something that we've been covering quite a lot as well. And especially in really, I mean, about around the election, yes, there was there's definitely the need, but around the pandemic as well in the last one year, um, I mean, I'm originally from India and I've got these family groups where I'm part of the WhatsApp groups and the kind of information that comes through um, is very frustrating sometimes because you see WhatsApp groups being sent about how you outside in the sun for 10 minutes every day, you don't get COVID. Um, or if you have COVID, it's still okay to go out and hug people because, you know, COVID doesn't spread by touch. That's totally, that's that's exactly going on the opposite side of what, what the truth is. So um, what I tend to do is sometimes send them the wrong, uh, send them the right link and say, hey, that's not true. But that's just one part of it, as I said. There's, 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 it's a country of 1.4 billion people. There's a lot of misinformation being spread. And it's also um, led to the second, second wave, a massive second wave back in the country because there's still a lot of misinformation being spread. Um, so, I mean, in terms of working with countries like that, in terms of, I mean, one of the things that I think is talked about quite a lot is how big tech companies like Facebook and Twitter, a, a lot of misinformation here is being spread using these social media platforms. Um, India or China are one of some of the biggest users of these social media platforms, but they have failed in scaling back misinformation. They have really failed in trying to stop the spread of misinformation. Um, what's the, I mean, you, you talked about fact checking uh, companies, but that's still a very small pie in the, in the big uh, sort of misinformation debate. So what, what can be done to 
work more with these social media companies or uh, for us to come up with the state like power that like the one that Facebook has or Twitter has it almost feels like nobody can fight them right now um i, I mean i'm going to keep it open to both of you who are um, I'll, I'll jump in first on this one, if that's OK. So you said that that you're, what you've been doing when sharing into family groups is, is just a small part of it. But actually, I think that's that's a major part of it, because the way to fight this is for you and people like you in those family groups to be able to all do this and tackle it at a local or family level. One of the things that we, and, and I used to think that the kind of global solution to misinformation um, and trusted media was a, a global solution, but actually I think it's, you think it's a local solution. I think it's a community solution. And one of the things that we did with our building our initiative in India to do this was actually the process of thinking, right, most of this stuff is being shared in family WhatsApp groups. Uh, it's being shared by um, the elder people in these groups who pro possibly can't be challenged uh, by the younger people. So what do we do? Well, let's create a resource for younger people to come to and you know, put the blame on us and say, it's not me saying this, it's these people who have checked this. I, you know, I'm not questioning you. Um, and what we've been able to do is transfer that to uh, evolve that into our work in Africa and think about the nuances of different communities in the countries that we're working with to think, how can we get that shared within those family groups? So we may be publishing things on social media, but really we know that they, the value is if someone downloads them or screenshots them and shares them in a WhatsApp group. Um, so I, I think what you say is, is, absolutely spot on but we need to deal with that at scale and that's the the entry point where we talk to the social media platforms they love the idea of scale any solution to this has to be able to scale um but the solutions possibly have to come from outside of the technology platform meeting rooms um and come from community organizers and journalists and those who are experts in communicating communicating misinformation to large audiences or specific communities? Uh, Dita, right? Any thoughts for you? <laughs> yeah, so I I absolutely agree with Fergus um, that you know it needs to be community driven, but at the same time, I'm always a proponent of multi level stakeholder engagement. So that includes bottom up, and also includes top down. And what we've started to see is that more and more young people are not going to the CNNs or the BBCs for their news. They're going to Facebook, they're going to Twitter, they're going to Reddit, they're going to the social platforms um, as their news source. Now, when these companies originated, it didn't start as a news platform. It started as a social sharing platform, right? And it's morphed now because of the, the scale of these platforms and how um, social sharing has become a huge part of information sharing. Uh, and so there needs to be an evolution of these organisations at the same time as us working as civil stakeholders to arm ourselves with correct information. And, and you know, we see new types of things now where Facebook have implemented some types of things where they will say this is being fact-checked and is inaccurate, right? And it comes over the top of the post. Um, and so when I've even seen that with some of my intelligent, well-educated friends who are sharing stuff and then they're sharing and then it comes up over the top of their post, sorry, this is not matching with our fact checking. And so I think that, and, and that's really, really important because uh, in interviews with young people, uh, many are very conscious around not sharing misinformation, but 30 to 40% of the respondents in the research that I've read say they have accidentally shared something or they have shared something only to realise it was misinformation later on, but it wasn't their intention. So how do we bring these groups together? I think technology is a really important part of this because if we can, you were mentioning earlier that the fact-checking platforms were very small. In, in your newsroom, there were one. And then when Trump came in, there were many fact checkers hired. So how do we integrate the fact checking mechanisms uh, through the technology platforms into the social platforms, as well as make them accessible to community participants? So if, if I might jump in on that, um, no. something that, that a lot of people don't, don't realise about the, platform, the Facebook fact checking is that actually 
the Facebook fact checking is driven entirely by third party fact checkers. So you have to be an accredited fact checking organization um, and you have a a special system behind behind the scenes where you get flagged content and then you 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 can debunk it and those are because facebook doesn't deal with content or doesn't deal with editorials so that is outsourced to the third party fact checkers and so there is that integration but i don't think that that's translating to the trust in uh, trust in fact checkers because the the kind of connection is is visibly weak so i i completely agree i think that um, there needs to be that connection and, and there is, but people don't know about it and it needs to be a lot stronger because if you can show that this is an independently checked piece of information, um, then then you've got a bit more power behind you. And it's gone through several versions, several iterations because at the beginning, um, when someone said that this is disputed content, uh, the flag was actually driving the traffic to that post because mm. it became more attractive. Um, and I think that if journalists, again, people who uh, and news organizations and media companies have been involved, who know how media works, that could have been avoided, and the iterations could have could have happened a lot quicker to get to to this point. But um, mm. I think greater greater connection with fact checkers is is incredibly important. But no one else wants to pay fact checking. Well, I mean, I think that if I can just add to that point, Fergus is oh. you know prior. Sorry. Prior to social media, um, it was assumed fact checking was going on behind mm. the scenes, right? That journalists would be fact checking before they reported. And I've seen some journalists' careers like really wrecked and ruined because they didn't fact check eff- effectively and then it was called out, right? So, but now that the sharing of the information is globalized and in the hands of us as everyday people, I think we're going through a cultural shift and we need to, where fact checking then needs to not be something that's a responsibility of third parties or somebody else, but that it sits in on all of our laps and just becomes a part of our due diligence on the information that we're interacting with. And there's not really the space to say, you know, this is under dispute or whatever and have these multi iterations of it because, as you said, people jump on stuff that's controversial. I think there needs to be mechanisms by which the speed at which things are fact-checked and then determined as fact-based or not needs to be faster and it needs to be concise. So this is inaccurate. This doesn't meet with fact-checking requirements, but there needs to be much more availability in general to the fact-checkers as um, a part of natural reading, writing, sharing, you know, so that it becomes inbuilt. It's not something that's a nice to have add on that they have to pay for. It's just part of like we have Amazon to buy our stuff online, right? So why don't we have fact checking mechanisms that we can just easily access? I don't know if, you know, my neighbors know how to engage a fact checking engine or mechanism to check whether what they're reading is is based in any kind of fact or not. So it, there's still a disconnect in accessibility. You were mentioning, Fergus, transparency, yes, but I think there has to be accessibility and making it easy for people to be diligent. At the moment, it's not so easy. So what's stopping us from having that sort of tool right at our doorstep? And how can we get that? Money. Nobody's figured out a way to monetize it yet. <laughs> Uh, I, I speak to students, um, or whenever I do a whenever I do a, a talk, especially to students or student journalists, um, I always ask them what news they pay for, uh, and you only get one hand. Or if if anyone pays for news, and you get one hand up in a room, um, and these are journalism students who want to be in the industry, and if people have ad blockers, and most people put their hands up, so then I ask them, well, how on earth do you expect to be paid when you? Um, when you are entering this industry, you want these these amazing jobs, but you're not prepared to to to, to put the money in. Um, and that's if you, that's for for journalists. Imagine what it's like elsewhere. So, um, fact checking is is expensive. It takes time. You have to get people, as you said, Peter. People, these fact checkers are they know their subjects and they know their craft and they know, they know what they're doing. That takes time and training um, and investment. And so until people are prepared to pay for that, I, I don't see um, 
a way that it it works. And if you want to train the community, like people to to fact check for themselves, there have to be some really careful resources created um, that allow people to do that. And also they have to have credible sources to do their checking against, which probably comes back to the journalists uh, or the news organizations again, or academics. Um, and academics have their own problems in terms of communicating things quickly uh, and concisely. So it's a bit of a, a, a kind of vicious cycle, really, because uh, how do you get to that end point where someone puts some money in or someone uh, picks it up and, and runs with it? I mean, yeah. we can put it out there as we can put it out there as a challenge. We can put it out there as a challenge. Like, who wants to be brave enough to figure out a way to monetize a fact checking platform that can be readily accessible to people who don't have the money to pay for fact checking? You know, that could be a new technological development. There's a real gap in the market for that because people do want to understand if what they're reading is based in fact or not. But just nobody's figured out a way to develop a a model for that. No, and the the platforms are trying, clearly. I mean, they spend millions uh, a year supporting fact checkers in news organizations, but none of those models are necessarily sustainable um, for for kind of future years. They they work in the moment. Um, but it's yeah, it's a it's a huge a huge task and a huge challenge. I would I mean I spend I spend all my time thinking about that. So <laughs> I have to find a way to to, I think it requires cross industry collaboration because ultimately it benefits everyone. If you think about kind of corporate communications, um, uh, if you think about academics, if you think about governments, that everyone has a, has an interest in accurate information, um, uh, and everyone has a different something different to offer as a component part to that solution. And, and I do think that there is a the only way to do it is through a collaboration of of size. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, th one other thing that I wanted to sort of put your brains on, both of you, is sort of when when journalists make their way into news organizations, and you talked about speaking to student journalists, Fergus, I think journalism schools are also an extremely important place to talk about misinformation, to sort of uh, get, you know, train, have that right training in place. Um, I think one thing, yes, of course, in the last four years of Trump's presidency, we've heard the term fake news so much, but it's also made us extremely aware of the spread of misinformation, the risk around, uh, you know, misinformation and what it can lead to, especially when you've got a presence saying that you can inject yourself with disinfectants and that treats COVID. The next thing, you just don't know what to believe and what not to believe. And as news organizations, you've got massive burden. But I mean, so there is definitely that training that needs to go for reporters as well before they join news organizations. But um, I mean, are you, is that something that you're seeing around you when you speak to student journalists, uh, Fergus, when you do you see that sort of uh, push to train uh, young reporters or young interns so that they start thinking along those lines? I think they are thinking along those lines already. I think they are a generation. Journalism students now are, are a generation who, um, as Peter was saying earlier, have, have not are not watching CNNs and BBCs. They are on the social platforms and they may not be kind of filtering or analyzing news all the time for, for in terms of veracity, but they are you know, like social content and uh, posts from their friends or about their friends or about anything that they might be following. So I think they have the, some of those skills and they are implementing them. If they implement them in terms of news and information, then, then that's probably just showing them how to do that, that kind of transfer of, of skills. So I, I definitely see that enthusiasm, but the problem with training again, well, no training is important, but you have to keep on top of it because next year it will be out of date. Um, yeah. and, and that is, that is always the challenge. So it's got to be something that is, is ongoing. And I, I, as much as I hate talking about ecosystem changes because they're almost impossible, there has to be some kind of mass change in the way that we work on this. Yeah. Right. Peter, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I want to jump on Fagus's almost impossible for ecosystem <laughs> changes. <laughs> Because uh, our company is actually working on uh, establishing a fund that tackles system-wide change across social and environmental challenges. And you don't need one thing to transform a system. You need a collective of initiatives that work across the pressure points of a system to transform a system. And we're designing those things in for-profit businesses uh, to tackle collectively. So you're building an ecosystem of uh, Con contributors 
to transforming a system, if you like. And so I think that the challenge for us is to step out of how we're tra traditionally used to thinking about problems and solutions, um, because we can't continue to think from the perspective that's kind of led to some of the problems that we have right now. <laughs> we have to somehow shift our lens and think about things differently in order to find solutions that are really, uh, you know, full of initiative and full of innovation and full. And, and so that's why I think if we're talking, you know, one thing that my company does is we take a what we call a regenerative approach to systems design, which is where we look at the system from the perspective of an ecosystem. Because natural living systems work in ecosystems that have reciprocity, they have mutual benefit, and um, and we don't think about that. We think it's all very linear, very mechanistically when we're trying to solve problems. So I think stepping back from this kind of linear way of trying to solve problems and thinking more in terms of, of an ecosystem, allowing us to engage in that level of complexity, but find opportunities with which to engage the ecosystem in a way to transform it is kind of where we are at now. And it's not just uh, with respect to news media. It's also how do we deal with issues on climate change? How do we meet our 1.5 degree targets? How do we transform the monetary system so that capital flows effectively to impact? Uh, how, you know, there is, how do we bring gender parity? into large corporate organisations that are still very traditionally run in a very masculinized way. So there are many, many things that we need to start thinking about differently, not just this particular topic, but I think this topic feeds into the ecosystem of global social issues that we're currently challenged by because we've we, the, part of the challenge is and we were talking about this with respect to regulation, uh, even with respect to reporting regulation. So you have a global challenge, which is the spread of news, super fast, you know, sometimes faster than what fact checkers can check and no way to monetize responsibility. But then the regulation is still happening at a sovereign level. So we're trying to solve global social issues from national policy and the national policies don't intersect. There's no like um, kind of sharing of wisdom or thought about how to tackle these large scale social issues from a governance level. Um, so every country's off doing its own thing, implementing its own policies. And we saw that with COVID and the COVID response, every country was kind of doing its own thing. And it led to a giant cluster, you know, of waves and, and, and all this kind of business. So even thinking about how we do good governance and particularly even around news, without being all big, big brother about it, needs to shift. We need to get really creative there and thinking about, well, actually, how as a human species do we actually tackle global challenges? Because at the moment, we're still thinking very, very nationalistically. And I think that there's a fragmentation there that's not really working. Sorry, I was just going to jump in and say that sounds extremely interesting. My only concern, and without being skeptical, but I'm a journalist, so I have to be skeptical about that, is um, a, a change like that requires loads of stakeholders to come together. How do you bring everyone together? There's just so much for people in. I mean, there's just so much money that's that's at stake at that, you know, talking about this change that we are talking about. Um, you know, I, I would love to be positive, but I would really love to, like to understand how would you bring all the stakeholders? To well, I think, I think that's why the UN SDGs was such a breakthrough, such a precedent. They got 190 plus nations to sign to the SDGs. Admittedly, they don't all know yet. There's not yet a coordinated approach to the roadmap, um, but that's what they're trying to achieve with COP and the Paris Agreement. But nevertheless, they were still able to get all of these nation states to agree on a set of principles. That's the first time I think ever, unless someone wants to fact check me, <laughs> that that's actually happened. <laughs> so I think we're starting to move in that direction, but it just is about how do we manage our stakeholders differently? and start seeing ourselves as part of a global ecosystem and, and, and an active participant in that rather than viewing ourselves and our world from our little box. I, I agree um, entirely with that. And I think cross industry, cross, cross everything collaboration and, and talking is, is important. I, I really, I really subscribe to the idea that we need to get creative. And one of the things that frustrates me so much about this specific topic is that basically all of the funding is going into research 
And the research is coming out every time and saying the same thing, that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. And actually, what we're now at the time where funding, money, cold, hard cash needs to go into ideas that are being tested in real time to fix this. Because the only way that you can actually work out what's happening is to test it. If you do the research and you look at it and, and, and it becomes an academic only exercise, by the time you finish that, it's moved on two years again. Mm. So what we need to do are real time experiments, real time innovation and creativity in coming up with solutions and see what works and throw it out if it doesn't work, but test it and test it and test it. Yeah. And I think this brings us to the conversation of capital and capital flow, because, you know, if we're looking at impact investing, still it's it's basically like the standard VC playbook with a bit of impact yeah. sprinkled in there. There's no money going into really genuine innovation because the whole VC mechanism is that you just need to see increase in revenues, like multiples of 10, you know, and then you get your next bun bunch of investors in. You look at Uber, you look at Farfetch, they've nev um, never made a profit. There's no mm -hmm. sustainable finance actually happening. People are growing wealth just by bringing in new capital everywhere. So if they don't think that something can get the next bit of capital, in order to increase their wealth, they're not going to invest in it. So they're not really trialing brand new stuff that challenges idea of scale, that challenges traditional ideas of, of what can actually make money or how things can actually work. And you can see that, you know, with the, the co-op, the milk co-op in India, that's now worth over a billion, that started with a farmer with two cows. Yeah. You know, that spread globally. Uh, around India and as now as a cooperative worth over a billion globally, that challenged the concept of scale, that challenged the concept of how capital can drive um, new uh, innovation and sustainability. But we're only just seeing people starting to talk about that now. And it's really, really late in the game, you know, because we've got our climate driven 10 years of action, which started last year. We're already into year one. <laughs> We're nowhere near hitting our targets on this particular issue, let alone other innovations that we need to develop, like this particular kind of access to, uh, you know, fact-checking for news and things that are critically important for our sense of social well-being. Um, so I think that, that, that the, the, the capital conversation here is a really important one. It's not just about collaboration and public-private partnerships or inter inter into sector partnerships, but how do we actually drive funding towards these types of really genuine breakthrough innovations? Okay. Well, we've got only two minutes left, so uh, I'll give you guys 30 seconds each. But my question to you is, there's a trust deficit between media companies, between social media companies and, and the public, the exact same kind of trust deficit that was in 2008 between banks and, you know, the general public. Um, it's taken a long time, but people still don't trust banks. Is this going to continue with the media companies as well? Do you see this trust deficit sort of just extending for a long time? And if there is a way to bridge it, 30 seconds each. I don't think it has to go in for a long period of time. I think the more active and uh, responsibility each of us as community stakeholders take in thinking critically and arming ourselves, empowering ourselves rather than relying on the truth to sit in the hands of some other third party that's going to deliver it to us, then the trust bridge will take place. And, and I think the media has lost trust. Uh, I think they've been blaming other people for a long time. I don't think it matters whose fault it was because, but because ultimately it's the media's job to regain that trust and build that trust in any way. Um, and I think both the, the, the kind of media and audiences have to meet halfway somehow um, for that kind of reconciliation process. And, and then we've got a chance of, of it closing, but it's got to be earned and it's got to be kept. Well said. Perfect. Thank you very much for those closing remarks. It's been such a pleasure to moderate this panel. Um, and I've really enjoyed the discussion. So thank you again to both of you. Um, and hopefully I'll get to see you both in person sometime. Uh, but thanks for your time today. Uh, thank Good you luck. so much. Thank you, everybody.